Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to Geeks Not Nerds, the podcast. I'm Captain Logan. And I am Vince. And Vince, today we're going to be talking about Pixar, and we've invited a special guest. Today we have Aaron Dicer on. Hey, guys. And Aaron is a radio personality out of Springfield, Missouri, and he's also a giant Pixar buff. Uh, yeah, a little bit too much of a Pixar buff, I think. I've got a sickness, I think. <laughs> uh, all you have to do is go watch his uh, YouTube videos, and you'll see his sickness all over his office. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's the messy. decor. What was that, Vince? So that sounds messy. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Aaron, uh, when you reviewed Cars 2, uh, I liked how you opened it because you said, if you've ever noticed watching my videos, I have no Cars stuff. Yeah. Yeah, the original Cars just didn't impact me on the same level as a lot of the other Pixar movies. And I, I think I think I've put my finger on why that is, and, and I think I felt the same way during Cars 2. It, just recently I figured out why, I, why I'm a little put off by Cars. Okay. I think it's because it's the only one of the Pixar movies that has to exist in some sort of alternate universe to be true. Oh, and that bugs you? Yeah, well, it doesn't feel like a human world, and so it doesn't feel like a human story. And I think it must be like completely subconscious, but it's I think it's something on some level that's that kind of affects the way I see that world. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. From a, from a story uh, place, as long as the you find the characters compelling, it shouldn't matter. No, I think I think you're right, and like I said, it, it's probably some sort of subconscious, uh, weird kind of thing. But I, for some reason, I just I don't know. I wouldn't say it's creepy, but on some sort of subconscious level, I think there's just something off about it. Like those are those are cars. Like there's supposed to be humans <laughs> inside of them. So like, have they been eaten? Like it's just it's just a weird. You know, I, I see what you mean. Yeah, although I think it's kind of, I think it's kind of good that they didn't try to go too far to explain it. No, I agree. I completely agree. <laughs> you know what I, mean? I mean, it's like it's like we're riding around, but you're right. I mean, they've got calves, they've got seat belts. There's nothing yeah. that's nothing's in them. I never really thought about that, but I did always think that they were going maybe a little bit too far by having insects, insects that were also cars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, and the, but see, that's part of the shtick of the movies too, and I guess you got to give them credit for it. Is and part of the design, which is incredible, is every little nuance of that world is designed for a universe of cars. So, yeah. you know, they've really thought about that stuff. You talk about the bugs. Yeah, that's, you know, kind of cute and funny. But, you know, the, the way that they have the houses built, the way the cities are built, the landmarks, all that stuff is automobile centric. Well, I guess I got preoccupied about it, but what I thought was weird about the bugs was that in Cars 2, they talk about cars being manufactured. Yeah, no. You're There's right. a mention of it, and it was just weird because because somebody mentioned a car, a, a car, and then they said, "Oh, they don't make those anymore." And I was like, "What?" <laughs> is there, no, a, is there a semi right. called a stork? I don't know. I'm just <laughs> and there was and because the other thing that I thought was bizarre, and I, I don't know, I'm running off right now, but I, I thought it was a little strange that every vehicle in both movies is a sentient creature except for that tar thing in the first one. The tar thing. The, the, the Bessie. Oh, the big yeah. no, tar right. thing that he has to that he has to carry down the street, and like that thing doesn't seem to to be a to be a sentient creature, but all the other ones are. Maybe it's some sort of weird kind of slave race or something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There's some scary fanfic in there. Somewhere. Yeah, somewhere, somewhere. <laughs> yeah, that makes so, me so, like cars a whole lot more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I gotta second watch. I gotta say about the original Cars, and Cars 2 didn't have this as much because I don't think it was trying to. Uh, but but I don't know. Cars hit me in that in that special spot the way some of the other ones have. And I gotta admit, there's a scene in that that I cannot help but tear up every time I see it. And I think it's because um, I'm from a really small town in the South. Yeah. No, I'm I'm with you on that. I teared up uh, probably at the same at the same place. Um... Where they're talking about you know the ghost town and they're taking the drive and and that kind of thing. That's right, yeah. And and the and the music cue just hits yep. in a certain. Yeah. Oh no, it's great, it's great. And in fact, I was going to say, Cars Two is actually the first Pixar movie I haven't teared up in at all. Well, there was no there was no play. They didn't try it. No, no, it's an action movie. But as an action movie, I had a good time. Yeah, I I think here's the deal. Pixar is incredible. They're great at what they do. Uh, they, they're amazing. And because they've kind of set this bar for themselves, it's hard to, for me to look at cars Two and call it a success because, you know, it's only a 85% as opposed to a 98%, you know? So it's kind of one of those things where you set the bar that high and 
you kind of missed it this time for me. But you're still an amazing movie. I mean, I'd still put it up against, you know, any of the other animated movies that are out. Well, I was going to ask you, I, we, I made this point last week, Vince and I did a podcast about um, unfair criticism. Yeah. And, and, and that, that, what happened with Cars 2 fueled me for that, because I felt like a lot of critics were, were knocking it just because it wasn't genius. Because the rest of of, of, uh, of Pixar's movies more or less ha- you know have been to a lot of people, and so I made the case that had a movie just like Cars to been put out by DreamWorks, it would have gotten a different score. Would you buy into that? I'd, I'd absolutely buy into that. Yeah, I think that's a great point. It's a valid point. I think with criticism, whether it be from like a technical movie critic or just from a fan. We have these human elements that are going to play into how we see something, and expectation is part of that. It's why I can go to a movie that I don't expect much out of and love it, even though if I had gone to the same movie expecting a bunch out of it, I probably would have you know, not enjoyed it as much. So it's well, that, That's true, yeah. And what I was trying to say was, as a critic, we've got to try to put as much of that aside as we can. Yeah, it's tough, though. Yeah, it is. Sure. Yep, sure. Well, uh, we all three – oh, hi, Vince. Are you still with us? Oh, yeah. Wait, where am I? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry about that. But I wanted to cover Cars too, and Vince hasn't seen it, so you had to kind of lay out for a second. I was um, kind of lost in thought for a second. Yeah, what were you thinking about? I was thinking about uh, critics needing to put some of their uh, some of their personal hoo ha aside, and I thought, you know, you know, what was it? My thought has left me. It was pretty much just me sitting here thinking, well, critics need to do that, and I thought, you know, some of us are professionals, <laughs> and then some of us are a guy on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I try really hard to be both, but okay. Uh, so we, the three of us, have each picked our three favorite Pixar films, uh, features, and then our uh, favorite shorts. Uh, Aaron, would you like to start us off? Sure. What do you, you want? Uh, why don't you? Why don't we start with the features? Okay. And uh, we'll each do our our our, th- our third one. Okay. Uh, number three for me is uh, The Incredibles. Uh. One of my uh, all-time favorite scenes in cinema history is in that movie where Dash runs on the water. Uh, I just I, – all through that entire movie, I had this sense that I was a child again, that I was – it was like this wish fulfillment movie. And at the same time, it was this really compelling family story. Uh, I just I, – I really enjoy The Incredibles. Of course, it's beautiful too, which, which all Pixar movies are. Vince? Uh, I almost put it at number two, but I, I too chose The Incredibles. <laughs> For number three, I mean, uh, I, I've always had this sort of affinity for the Fantastic Four in comic books, and then uh, and then they make The Incredibles, and I think, wow, you know, this covers a lot of the same issues, only it does it in a different way. So it was still original to me, with while still hitting some of the same things that I like from previous uh, superhero-related things that I've read. And uh, I couldn't help but uh, really sympathize with the father character. I thought uh, Mr. Incredible was uh, was was the man to be and when when he became not the man to be essentially after the whole uh superhero legality i'm going to call it that making up a word if that's not a word already but uh <laughs> the, uh, the yes, uh, yes vince legality is a word you're good go ahead it's a chill legality it's oh oh no that, that's legality okay it's maybe not but i'm gonna start using it yeah i like clever things that don't have a right to exist anyway the, <laughs> the uh, Mr. Incredible was just a guy who was so broken that I couldn't like the strongest man in the world cannot be as strong as he needs to be. I mean, uh, it, it's interesting to me the, uh, the the dichotomy of a guy who is physically strong but uh, emotionally just a wreck because of the world that he's living in. And, and I love stories about people finding themselves and becoming stronger than they were, a broken person becoming a Herculean character, essentially. Anyway. You know, what's what's beautiful about that subtext that exists not only for him but the other characters is how well it plays into their superpowers. And they they lay it on so subtly and beautifully that, you know, a careful observer is going to pick it up, but it just becomes part of the subtext of the movie. And, you know, uh, Violet being invisible and, and wanting to hide out and not, you know, be out there dash being, you know, energy. I mean, it's just it's it's really beautiful metaphor all the way around. And could feel like a cliche in something else. Yeah, exactly. If not, if not played right, um, I also think Incredibles is uh, is impressive in in that a they said that they weren't sure how they'd ever do humans well. At Pixar, they were always worried about doing a movie of just of, of of humans, and then they pulled it off in that as well as they did. And the other thing is, I think it's got one of the best soundtracks out of all of Pixar's. Um, movies that like every every time I see that movie that um, that theme gets stuck in my head. 
Yeah, it, it is beautiful, although I have to say, Pixar has a track record of phenomenal scores. Oh, they do. Yeah. yeah. And, and, my, and I think number one has my favorite, but I'm not going to tell you what that is. <laughs> uh, my number three is Up. Nice. One of the things that really impressed me with Up, and maybe this isn't you know fair to, to say that this is part of why I even ranked it in my top three, uh, but that's a movie that's really difficult to explain to an audience what it is in advertising. Like, every every other Pixar movie, nearly, I mean, it's, okay, this one's about fish, and this one's about superheroes, and this one's about cars. You get to up, what is it? Um, it's about some balloons on a house. I mean, like, <laughs> when you when you watch the, the trailers, it's like, what is this movie? It looks like some, like, wiggy storybook thing brought to screen. But what, what I loved about it was that it's a movie that speaks to, I mean, like all Pixar movies, it doesn't just speak to, to kids or just to adults, but it's... You know, still very much for kids as long as it is, you know, for for adults. But it's about an old guy, yeah. and it's about help reminding people to have appreciation for older folks. And I just loved that. And it, and I mean, like uh, everybody, I think that I've ever talked to about it said they cried in that first half hour. Oh my goodness. And, and that and it's 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 amazing because uh, there's no it's 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 kind of like uh, Wally in that at, at the beginning there's hardly any dialogue anywhere and you're learning all of this background without anybody having to give you exposition through dialogue or anything like that and uh, it it's it also was a really good reminder of what animation is for yeah. I know um, Alfred Hitchcock once said that the best movies are movies you can turn the volume all the way down and still understand what's going on. And I think Pixar has a great grasp on that, that they tell their story visually as much as they do in any other way. And th that scene, those 10 minutes or whatever it is of that backstory is supremely powerful. I felt weird about it, too, because when, when, I, when I saw it, my wife and I went to uh, the Forkin screen at the AMC, uh, which is uh, where you can go you know, have dinner while you're watching your, your movie. And I'm, I'm in the middle of a bite of pizza watching that scene, oh and I'm just like, ah, <laughs> <laughs> trying, trying to eat my pizza. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I love Up, and I'll go ahead and give away. It did not make my top three, but it was right on the cusp. It's probably number four, and... Uh, I just, and you know, you talk about the the you know being about an old guy and who is it? Ed Asner is that who they voice cast for that? I, I think, think so. so. That's another thing I love about Pixar that is different from a lot of the animation houses is they hire voice talent based on character mm -hmm. and character alone, and they don't worry about putting big names on the screen. They want a great character on the screen, and I love that. And sometimes they get big names, but sure, you forget, but you forget that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Like, like watching it, you're not thinking, oh, that's Tim Allen or oh, that's this person. I mean, the, the the like, I have to remind myself when it's people I know. Yeah, especially um, yeah, I was with Cars just being recently out. Uh, who is it that plays Lightning? Is that Luke Wilson or Owen Wilson? Uh, Wilson. Owen, Owen Wilson, yeah. I, I, that he, just came to me the other day. I was like, oh yeah, that's Owen Wilson. No, it's Lightning McQueen. You know, it's it's great. Although well, that's with interesting because I could never get it out of my head that, that it was Owen Wilson, or or I could get it out of my head that it was. Tom Hanks, but uh, Tim Allen and Owen Wilson, I always keep feeling like I'm listening to their voices. Interesting. Uh, although, although with Cars 2, I, I do have to say, uh, the, the, the main uh, spy car, um, uh, oh, who is that? The, the, uh, why can't I think of his name right now? The guy, the guy who plays Alfred in the Batman movies. Oh, Michael Caine. Michael Caine, yeah. Now, I do have to say, I was thinking Michael, <laughs> Michael Caine. Sure, sure. Sure. <laughs> Because that was just Michael Caine playing that. Yeah, I played yeah. Michael Caine. Uh, Aaron, what's your what's your number two? Number two is a little bit of a cheat for me. I apologize, but I've combined the three Toy Story movies in at number two. Yeah. Uh, I, it's, it's hard for me to separate them. Honestly, if I, I had to do a legitimate top three, two of the Toy Story movies would probably be number two and number three. Uh, so I went ahead and, and combined them. That series of movies, um, it changed movie making. It changed film, period. Yeah. It did. The way I went with this is I picked my three favorites instead of uh, what I thought were the three best because I would have had to do the same thing and it would have been boring. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I didn't put any of the Toy Stories on just because it was obvious. <laughs> yeah. No, I, but, but you know but what? If I, yeah, but I mean, like, toy, I don't know, Toy Story 3 came really close I was just, uh, just because for, for, for me, that was the best story. I agree. Toy Story 3 is great. Um, as far as my personal favorite, I think I still have the second one above the third one. Uh, that just hit me in, in just a – it may have just been the, the moment in life or whatever, uh, just the fact that, that I was so glad that Pixar nailed a sequel, which was yeah, great news. 
Um, so I probably put number two just above number three. And and the original Toy Story is still a great movie. Still yeah. a great movie. Yeah. Yeah. Ni- 1995, the very first computer animated feature, and it still holds up. I know it's incredible. Vince. You know, it never occurred to me that uh, Toy Story was the first computer. Like, like it's so good that I just assumed that they've been doing it forever. I mean, there had been a lot of computer animated stuff, and and, and I mean, like like short films, and but but yeah, feature. So, what's your number two, Vince? My number two is uh, Ratatouille. Really? Yeah. That's surprising. I just think is... the comedy is so effective. I think it's. Uh, uh, you're going to say something. Well, I know. I actually, I was going to say that uh, though Ratatouille is a, is a strange choice. Uh, I think it's a great choice, and it's even better because you're two for two with Brad Bird movies. Oh, good call. Yeah, I forgot that was Brad Bird. Yep. Oh, I like things that can fly, apparently. <laughs> and that's an and that's an interesting choice. Uh, I mean, I mean, I'm sorry. That, that's an interesting thing considering that Brad Bird wasn't part of the uh, original Pixar team, and they they brought him on later. Yeah, he was kind of the he was kind of the only hired gun from that group. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, it's I mean, it's a great call. Iron Giant is a phenomenal movie, and uh, I cannot tell you how excited I am to see the next Mission Impossible. Oh, is he doing that? He's directing the next Mission oh, Impossible. Oh, I didn't. I didn't even know that. Yeah. Okay, cool. But, yep. Uh, if he can, if if he can bring this, the sensibilities of the Incredibles to the Mission Impossible universe, I'm in. Yeah, me. Yeah, me too, man. That's awesome. I didn't even know that. That was one of the things I thought was so cool about Incredibles was the. Uh, the, how much it was something that you would see from the time period of a, of a, like James Bond and Mission the, the, I think it was more, mostly the music that did that for me in The Incredibles. Yeah. But uh, was I talking about Ratatouille? We're yes, <laughs> Ratatouille. <laughs> I mean, I think that movie pretty well blends together a universe where uh, where humans and non-human characters can exist at the same time. And uh, and I think it was I once had a professor tell me. What a repulsive movie, Rats in a Kitchen. And, and I don't, maybe he just couldn't get past it, but for me, it made me believe that a rat could be a clean creature. It could, it made me, well, not in reality, but on the screen. <laughs> Cause. Did, did it make you believe that in the same way that Christopher Reeve made you believe a man could fly? Yes. In fact, I threw my cousin off a roof just to prove that in reality, <laughs> That's different. Depiction. Just the way you said that, I was imagining that being on the Ratatouille posters. <laughs> you will believe that a rat can be in a kitchen and be, and be a clean creature. Well, he did wash his paws. <laughs> it was. I thought it was a good movie because it was effectively about two people need, needing a symbiotic relationship. Uh, a guy who is new to this world, who is not a, uh, or a guy who is just fresh faced and and he's has no ex- discernible talent or personality. And as the movie goes by, he. He, he learns that he can be. He learns that he is his own person. And uh, yeah. I think it's interesting to see somebody drop so much fear throughout an entire movie. Yeah, and it's a great it's a great theme about uh, the whole anyone can cook thing. And I love it because it's not everyone can cook. It's not as if everyone can do it. It's as if a cook can come from anyone. Yeah, so it, that's it, a really good point. And there's a, there's a slight difference there that I love, and they they actually make this point in The Incredibles too, when they talk about if everybody is average, you know, and nobody is special, and yeah, if everybody's super, no one is. Yeah, yeah exactly. And uh, I just I think it's great because that's almost countercultural right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is which is kind of sad. Yeah, yeah, I sure. think, but. But anyway, uh, my number two is Incredibles, so moving right along. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I rated it. I rated it higher than you guys, and I, I don't know if it's. Uh, I don't know if that's partially just because I recently did a superhero rewind on it, and it's you know one of my higher rated superhero rewinds, and it's just you know fresh. Uh, but I, I always felt that that way about it, and, and uh, the same way you guys you guys said. Uh, before we go to our number one features, why don't we go ahead and uh, do the the shorts real quick? Sure, sounds good. You want me to start? Go ahead. Uh, it was difficult to pick one. But I'm gonna go with Jerry's game. Yeah. Uh, Jerry's Jerry's game is uh, a short film that is not located in any one of the Toy Story universes when it was made. <laughs> I should say that because that character actually does appear in Toy Story 2 and right. uh, as you know the the guy that fixes Woody. But uh, it was you know made outside the, any of their existing universes, and it's just this this perfect conceit of an old man playing himself in chess, and it has a great payoff, actually a double payoff, which I love, mm-hmm. and uh, and I just I enjoy it every time. 
Um, one of the things I let me interject this really quick too. Uh, it's neat that Pixar has continued putting shorts before their movies, and be, because I mean, you know, that 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 harkens back to an older time when we used to do this, and when we used to put cartoons in front of movies, and uh, and I kind of wish we'd go back to that a little bit. I kind of oh, wish I we love had, you know, little things before features. Yeah, um, that's that's one of the that's one of the joys of going to a Pixar movie. Yeah, and the other one, of course, when that's coming. The other one, of course, is seeing the the first teaser or preview for the next Pixar movie. Yeah, which they don't always do anymore. They don't? Well, I know they did Brave. I was, oh my goodness, I saw that. About wet myself. That was amazing. Yeah, well, when I went to Cars 2, I, we, we didn't see one. No! Oh, you huh. got zipped. Yeah, yeah, I didn't even see I was going to ask you about it because I didn't see that. Oh, yeah, no, no it, it was great. It looks, I mean, it just looks, it looks like they're going a little bit darker, which is, you know, okay, and I'm sure they'll handle it right, but it's just, it's very moody. The the art style is very moody, and it's in Scotland, and it's just beautiful. Wow. But yeah, it's it's great. Vince, uh, what short did you pick? Uh, I was going to pick Jerry's Game, but since, <laughs> since somebody <laughs> took mine, <laughs> uh, I think I'm going to go with Presto. I, it was uh, one of those things, I suppose, I, I'll say the same thing about it that I did about Ratatouille. The, uh, the, the comedy was just effective to me, and yeah. I thought it was interesting that it could be such a short little film about a rabbit trying to get a <laughs> trying to get a carrot, but essentially it uh these two people or these two people, this rabbit and this person, just work together. I don't know. I think that's something that's uh, a a very common theme in most uh Pixar movies is people who are essentially butting heads until they find out that they're better together. You know it's really interesting. It's it's interesting you say that because uh, I don't know if you've read into this at all, Vince, but uh, they're they're doing a prequel to Monsters Inc. Yeah, Monsters and University. That's, and that's exactly what that's going to be. Is it's going to be those two meeting for the first time and butting heads and becoming friends. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll love it, Vince. Yay! I <laughs> love things that have. have- common stuff that I've seen before. Wait. And you know, I'm usually a little bit anti-prequel, but I'm kind of on board with that. Yeah, re- yeah. I'm, I'm on board with whatever Pixar wants to do. They've earned my trust. <laughs> um, so I, I was, I had a tough time with the shorts. I thought about One Man Band. Uh, I really liked that one a lot. That's good. But I ended up going with Nick Knack. Yeah, sure. And part of it is that music just kills me every time. That's the one where... Uh, um, oh, the what's, one with the snow globe. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to remember the. He's a famous. Um, it's Bobby McFerrin. Bobby McFerrin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bobby McFerrin is a music huge music. Bobby McFerrin fan. Yeah. And like when that when that when I saw that in the theater, I forget what it opened in front of. I think it was maybe Finding Nemo that it opened in front of. Could I be. forget. Could be. Uh, but like, um, I, as soon as that started, I was like, "Is that Bobby McFerrin?" And then when it got to the end of it, and his credit was there, I was like, "Oh my God, that was Bobby McFerrin." But it wasn't just that. Um, it's it's just really funny. I think I think what I what I really liked about it the most was that it. Uh, it harkens back uh, again to um, a lot of old cartoon tropes, and you've got this snowman who's in a snow globe, and he keeps bringing out stuff he can't possibly have in a snow globe. Yeah, no, for he, sure. Like, he tries to blow it up, and he tries to use a jackhammer, and I mean, like, you just never know what he's. It's it's absurd, and you never know what's, what he's going to bring out. And I, and I think maybe part of the reason I liked it was because it was more absurd than Pixar usually goes. That's true. Yeah, it almost has an old Warner Brothers feel to it. And I'm a huge fan of Wile E. Coyote, and yeah. I kind of harken back to that a little bit. So, Yeah, for sure. Well, Aaron, what is your favorite feature? Uh, before I say that, I do have to give a shout-out to uh, the shorts Partly Cloudy and Day and Night. They're more recent, but they were just oh, phenomenal. Yeah. You're right. Um, my number one Pixar movie of all time uh, is Finding Nemo. Really? Yes, absolutely. And I think it comes on a very personal level for me. I have four boys. And uh, as a father, I watch that movie, and I just I'm living that that idea of finding that line as a parent, of letting my kids figure things out for themselves versus always protecting them and you know putting them in a bubble. And uh, I just think I think it's a phenomenal film. Vince. Oh, something I want to say about Finding Nemo since you brought it up. Albert Did you fall no, I feel, I'm, I'm still here. <laughs> Wait. I think I need to get up and shave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I do in the morning. Anyway, about Finding Nemo, something I think is interesting. Albert Brooks, I mean, that guy, even in his, his movies where he is a, a physical being, his voice is just the most interesting thing about him. And to have him be a fish 
I don't know. It just makes more sense to me because to me, Albert Brooks is more entertaining as a floating head, and now he's yeah. a fish. <laughs> it works well. Well, Ellen DeGeneres is amazing in that movie, too. Dory is one of the best characters Pixar's put on screen. She is just hilarious. And that's another great example of a, of, of, of a famous actor we've all or actress we've all heard of that we wouldn't have been thinking about watching that. Right, exactly. Vince, what's your number two? My, my number two was Ratatouille. I'm sorry, what's your number one? <laughs> my, what's your number five? My, my number one, I'm, I'm playing this one a little close to the heart as well, something that uh, strikes a chord with me personally, but uh, Wally. I choose Wally for, uh, for the reason, not so much the little robot guy, but more the state of humanity. Everybody is ballooned up into these enormous creatures who can't bend for themselves. And uh, me being a guy who's lost 140 pounds and went from being – uh, just abnormally large to being averagely sized. I mean, I suppose maybe I'm a little bigger than averagely sized, but that's genetics anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but Wally strikes a chord with me to see that uh, humanity can go to a state that's so, you know, awful and seems like you can't come back from that. And, uh, and it's, I had the same thing with Kung Fu Panda. You know, <laughs> it's these movies about, people who have weight problems and uh, are able to fight their way through it. And, you know, it's not so much just accepting yourself. It's bettering yourself. It's accepting your scenario and working toward ones that's better. Wally gets a lot of points for level of difficulty, too. Yeah. yeah. That's a hard movie to pull off with robots that don't really talk, you know. The dialogue is all kind of beeps and boops. And that was one of the I almost chose up as my number one because uh, because Wally and up had that thing in common where the first act of the movie, nobody actually says anything. And I, right. I find that to be extremely respectable if you can pull off a movie without having to put words in it. Hey, Vince, congratulations on losing the weight, man. Oh, thanks. Appreciate that. Um, it was a uh, lot of hard work. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I would ask you how it's done, but I'm guessing diet and exercise. Yeah, I used a uh, 90X. <laughs> Which is a diet and exercise program. I uh, I lost 130 pounds myself a few years oh, ago. Oh wow! Congrats. Yeah. yeah, it was a it was a process. So how much weight have you lost, Captain Logan? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I in the last a few months I've gained about 10 pounds, but I'm tiny. <laughs> I mean, if I lost but, too much weight, I'd just disappear. <laughs> how did you lose the weight? A diet and exercise. Yeah, <laughs> it's amazing what they always tell you, you know, do this and then it'll have an effect. And uh, so you do that and it has an effect. So yeah, it's want? incredible. It's incredible. You guys, you guys should conspire together and write a book called Diet and Exercise. <laughs> Get off of your couch and go out and do things. <laughs> yep. way, you, should, you should write a book and the, and the subheading should be the way it's been done for 5,000 <laughs> years. That's great. <laughs> uh, my my number one. It's so interesting. We all pick different number ones, uh, and my number one was not on anybody else's list. I picked Monsters Inc. Nice. That's a good choice. I uh, I love it. I, I I I couldn't get enough of it when it came out. I think I went to the theater and saw it two or three times. And uh, I don't know. I don't have the whole like close to the chest thing you guys have with it. I mean, like I have that. <laughs> it's so weird. Nobody nobody buys this with me. But like the. I had that with cars more than anything, really, uh, yeah. for the same reasons I said before. Uh, but and so I thought about cars a lot. But Monsters Inc. is just a really like the universe sucked me in. Is 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 I guess what it was with that. Like I was so impressed with how well they put together the um oh, the business. I mean, like the like it's it's about it's about commercialism. It's about business. Yeah, and they're monsters, and I'm like, it's it's just it's such a cool it's such a cool idea, and uh, it's it's like of all of Pixar's universes, that's the one I'd like to go walk into for a day. No, that's a great point. That is an absolutely great point, and that is a great movie. And when you mentioned scores, I almost brought up Monsters Inc. score because well, I do like that score. And I'm kind of glad you didn't because that was what I was talking about, yeah. man. Yeah. Uh, I, I I just. I just you can't get enough of the of the music in that. And uh, I got I got to bring this up real quick just because it's funny. I saw Monsters Inc. on Ice once. And wow. it was, it was really? awesome. I was surprised. Yeah, I really liked it. <laughs> um, do, you, do you mean the drug ice, or do you mean at an ice skating rink? <laughs> <laughs> no, 
No, Aaron. I <laughs> oh, okay. went to an ice skating rink. My, oh. my, my mother invited me, and I went. <laughs> okay. All right. I was just checking so to make Monsters sure. Inc. while sitting on a bag of ice. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't have any really real deep philosophical reasons for why I chose that movie, but I just love the thing. I actually, I actually do have a. I don't know if it's deep, but it is somewhat philosophical reason I love that movie, which is it. It is the Pixar movie that most encapul- encapsulates why they do what they do because laughter is more powerful than scream. That's a really good point. And they take joy in presenting joyful, fun family movies. In, in a more powerful way than people who use negativity to make movies. And I just, I think that's a great, great thing. Yeah, and I think part of the reason that they're so successful is because what they, what they do is really universal. Um, and it's kind of showing that, you know, we can make positive things and that's a little more universal than doing, you know, negative things. And, and a lot of people have, you know, these, these laundry lists of why they're so, um, they're so successful and why they've made the, the billions of dollars that they have. But I think that's, you know, kind of, kind of tops the list. Just they keep making movies people like. It's kind of that simple. Yeah. And I don't, I don't, I don't mean to get into the Pixar versus DreamWorks thing too much, but if you've seen the Pixar story, which I think I saw that, that you had just seen that recently. Yeah, I did. I watched it yesterday. I, I noticed it was on there, and I, I thought I'd, I thought it'd be good to watch that before I before. The, and by the way, uh, that's a really good documentary. Oh, it's great. If anybody if anybody hasn't seen it, uh, it's quite it's it's uh, it's quite informative. Uh, and I and I and I loved um, I love that they got uh, um, some of the people outside Pixar that they got to to uh, to talk about them, like uh, George Lucas and some other sure. people. Sure. But I was going to say, you know, in that doc- documentary, they talk about how Toy Story was originally just a mess because yeah. it was too negative. And because they were getting notes from, I think it was Jeffrey Katzenberg, I think, who eventually went to DreamWorks, who wanted it to be more snarky and more sarcastic, and and it just didn't work. And until they embraced the positivity aspect of it, uh, it you know, the story just didn't sing. So, and you can kind of see where DreamWorks went with, you know, Shrek is has a little more of the negative and that kind of stuff. It was a very successful movie, but I think uh, in you know 20 years, more people will remember Toy Story than Shrek. Yeah, and, well, and I've never heard I, – I haven't heard very many, if anybody, who just vehemently hated Toy Story. I mean, there's right. some people that were maybe indifferent to it, but, but, I, I, but I sure know some people that can't stand Shrag. Yeah, um, and, I, and I should also mention DreamWorks ha, is putting out some great films lately. Yeah, uh, how, how to Train Your Dragon was one of the best movies I've ever seen. Um, and uh, I don't know, just, just to put it in perspective, that's not to say that I don't like any dark movies. <laughs> oh, no, no, sure, but, sure, sure. Um, but I but I but I do think that helped them. Well, uh, any anybody have any uh, any final thoughts about Pixar that we didn't cover anywhere just because we did the list thing? I'm excited to see what's next. I'm excited for Brave and Monsters University and and whatever's after that. Yeah, do we know what's after that? We don't. Well, they, well, they're talking about um, supposedly it's a it's a top secret Pete Doctor film. Uh, Pete Doctor did uh, Up and uh, did Monsters Inc. So. Oh, okay. So he uh, he supposedly got the next one after that, and I guess they're really excited. It's an original story, um, but they haven't said what it is yet. Is he not is he not doing Monster the second Monsters Inc? No, he's not doing Monsters University. In fact, I think Monsters oh, University makes will me be. Cry. Yeah, I think it, but I think it's going to be a first time. You know, I could probably look that up, but I think it's a first time Pixar director. I think it's somebody from within that they want to give a shot. Oh, okay. Well, that's well, that's kind of cool. It makes sense though that they would give kind of an existing property to somebody like that. And I'm sure he's involved in the story meetings and and all that stuff. I mean, I'm sure he's not totally hands off on the project. Pete Doctor, that is. Vince, did you have anything else you wanted to talk about? Oh, I was just looking up Monsters University to see who the guy is that they've got slated to direct. Uh, Dan Scanlon, and writer Andrew Stanton and Pete Doctor. There you go. Oh, they just okay. they do the characters, cool. actually. Come think of it, that's what it says. Anyway, I'll click around later and find out, and so can you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, everybody check out uh, Aaron Dicer at AaronDicer.com, right? Yeah, you can check me out there uh, on YouTube as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, come say hey. And uh, Aaron's doing uh, some neat reviews, and, uh, and uh, not a lot of people have found him yet. So everybody go subscribe because uh, I'm watching him every time he posts stuff, and uh, it's great. And, and, and they're short but concise and informative. And uh, Aaron, I'm impressed with how much you can put into four minutes, dude. My stuff's like 15 minutes long. I, mean, I, <laughs> I, try, I try to use word economy. I script my stuff, and it's, <laughs> and it's 15 minutes. I don't know how you do that. You sit in front of a camera four minutes. You say everything you want to say, and, and, and you don't do any editing at all. 
No, no editing. No, there's no. It's amazing. Editing. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess I guess you're also trained. Yeah. Yes, trained in the the fine art of speaking in under four minutes. <laughs> the fine art of saying things. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Well, hey, everybody, uh, like I said, go uh, check out Aaron, and thanks a lot for listening to Geeks Not Nerds, the podcast. We'll be back with you next week with more fun topics. I'm Captain Logan. And I'm Vince. And I'm Aaron Dicer. (laughs) And we'll see you later.